Afternoon, folks. Thank you for tuning in to another Hobby Nightmares. We are at the start of a brand new week, so hopefully we can get you through this one as well as we did last week. Thank you for supporting Composite Games, by the way, because they continue to support the channel. Um, if you use the promo code Northern Exile down below on their website, you get an extra 5% off of your order at checkout, which means if you're already getting 20% off, you're getting a whopping 25% off your order at checkout. And a little bit of that money goes to help me in making some more Astral Blades and also getting some uh, prizes for the channel going forward that are to do with the hobby. So, um, to US people, I know you've been asking quite a bit uh, whether I can get a similar deal with somebody in the US to help you guys out. I am in the process of doing just that. It's going to take me a, a little bit, of, a few more days, I think, to get th get things up and running. But yes, I am, in, I am in negotiations and talking to a few people who are over there in the US. Hopefully they can help us out. So, moving onwards to some hobby nightmares. Let's have a little go here, shall we? I did get asked the other day, can we send in nightmares from other areas of the hobby? As in Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. Of course you can. And we have one of those debuting today at the end of this at the end of this uh, at the end of this session. And also it is a doozy as well. So st do stay tuned for that one. But first story is from somebody called Senator Legacy, and this is to do with the Lord of the Rings strategy battle game, which I'm really happy with because I never normally get uh, stories that are from this venerable old game. So, he says, Hey Northern, thanks for all your work. My story relates back to 2007, during the period when the Lord of the Rings strategy battle game wasn't quite the poor relation that it is today. My local branch of, D of GW, uh, Northern far former fishing town with a Sasha Baron Cohen film named after it, uh, Grimsby then, I'm guessing, uh, was holding a launch event for the Ruin of Arnor expansion. At the time, the store had the traditional no food in store policy but it was regulated with an extremely light touch, to put it mildly. There was a guy called Cameron who always used to come into the store on a Saturday and critique other people's games and models. He was one of, he was one of those that never seemed to have any of his own models with him, and it was purely a hangout place for him on a weekend. Well, he used to always grab lunch from Subway round the corner and have two foot-long meatball marinara subs to scoff them in the store. Fucking hell, two foot-longs. Meatball marinara, that's like... Isn't that like three days fat right there? I, fucking hell. He was overseeing the Ruin of Arnor scenarios being played, and needless to say, his sandwich was hovering dangerously over the battlefield. Freshly painted Dunadai rangers met a death of marinara sauce and melted cheese. Oh, God. The tabletop and scenery was covered in the overspill from Cameron's food. The store manager threw a hissy fit, even though he had been turning a blind eye to the... To the breaking of the, f of the hot food rule for a long time. It's amazing how little respect the guy had for the models, the people, uh, and, and the people who had spent months or years collecting and preparing. Uh, as a slight ad addendum to the story, I'm sorry to say, the branch is very much on its last legs, and not the community it used to be in those days. There's a third-party hobby shop in town, and that's taken all of their trade, and is much more respectable to the customers. Well, this is the danger, you see. This is the danger. Uh, you know, if, if you have... Games Workshop insisting on having third-party retailers being right next to a normal Games Workshop, that Games Workshop is going to suffer. And it's not the fault of the third-party retailers either. They're given a really good deal on their on their models and on the way that they, they treat their customers. All you have to do, if you're part of the part of the um, the third-party retailer movement, you know, you have your own hobby store, is to go check out your local Games Workshop. See what people like, what they don't like, what 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 their what their their gripes are with Games Workshop, and fill that void. That's all you need to do, and you're going to beat that Games Workshop in sales because you're already offering what the Games Workshop offers in terms of products, but for twenty odd percent off. You know, so no one's going to no one's going to shop at Games Workshop if you provide a, a viable alternative. Now that really sucks with the Games Workshop managers, which is why they're some of the most overworked, underpaid, and overly stressed people in retail, but. It is what it is, and I'm very sorry that this person's models had to go a scarper here. That's terrible. But anyway, thank you for your story, man. Okay, so High Fleet Kalish. Now, these are two very long stories, and I'm very much looking forward to getting neck deep into them right now. So, I was going to say something else there, but uh, quite glad I didn't. So, High Fleet Kalish. Hello, Exile. Hello, High Fleet. Love the channel. 
love that you focus that, that that you have a focus on talking as I'm always looking for content that I can listen to whilst driving or doing other chores. Yeah, I've noticed that. Thank you very much, man. I, I've noticed that. Um, I've noticed a lot of people like to listen to my stuff whilst they're doing other things. I wanted to fill that niche because quite a lot of times when I, I'm painting and doing stuff, when I look at people like Lewitin or, or I can't watch, put it this, this way, I can't watch battle reports whilst I'm doing um, anything else because you've got to watch it, you know. Um, so having something like this on in the background generally helps me. So I'm quite glad I'm, I'm, I'm able to fill that niche and people are getting a lot out of it. That's pretty cool. Okay, so High Fleet says, I live in the countryside now, starting a family and all that, so my hobby time has become very reduced and precious. And I mostly enjoy Warhammer quests and board games a lot more as it takes the pressure <clears throat> the pressure of needing to have a massive painted army off. That's true. There are many other ways of getting into the hobby. I'm a lifelong Tyranid player, and if you haven't already guessed by the name, and every now and then my best mates and I travel from afar to play some huge three-way grudge, grudge matches. As we have a lot of shared lore, we have been creating since high school. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. So you, you guys have oh, got your own planet and stuff and got your own campaign setting. That's awesome. It's usually Tyranids versus Imperial Guard versus Orcs. And they've been fighting over a solar system for centuries now. About 14 years in our reality. I don't mind that, that it takes months or even years sometimes for these get-togethers to happen. As it makes it all the more special to me when they do. I can't wait to induct my first child into such hallowed halls when they are a bit older and look forward to having a hobby room with a permanent quest game laid out on a table that we work on every weekend. So, I'm from Down Under, Australia. Huge country, lots of difference between places and only a handful of games workshops here. Yeah, and uh, you guys are literally screwed daily by the prices that are down there and also... You know, why don't you guys build inland like everyone else does? That's why you're so far away from each other. You're all built around a bloody coast. Anyway, <clears throat> it's, it's a famous joke by Steve Hughes, who's an Australian comedian. He says, uh, we love the land in Australia. We, do, we love the land. That's why we all live on the coast, looking at the sea. Anyway, High Fleet says, after listening to all the stories on your channel, I knew I had to give a few of my own. A theme I keep hearing from your channel is that, it, is that it seems more likely in the Northern Hemisphere that a creepy or toxic situation will happen at your local friendly game, gaming store. Hmm, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I very rarely get people from Australia writing in, so thank you for making that more of a thing. I guess it is true that with no oversight from a global company, the culture of the friendly local game store is very much what the owner and manager decide to nurture in Australia. In my experience... Australian friendly local game stores are usually much more interesting and nice places to be. And I've only ever seen a bit of toxicity. Might be something to do with consumer laws here, but most owners I have met seem protective of their store and don't allow bullshit or hate. So, I wanted to share a few stories of the funniest, interesting or most weird moments I've had in this hobby. When I lived a carefree life in Sydney as a uni student, oh my god, imagine being in Sydney as a uni student, Jesus. Um, I used to go to the local games workshop a lot. I liked it because it was small and the manager was a really nice bloke who wasn't a total games workshop shill. He was pretty relaxed ab about proxy models and he never pressured you to buy anything. Maybe he he did and he just had a very pleasant manner, I don't know. But his friendliness, his friendliness and laid backness, if that's a word, was certainly taken advantage of by some of, the, of his frequent flyer customers. I remember one time a pretty edgy high school teenager on a Saturday started to loudly argue with anyone that Eldar don't have sex, they don't have gender. Okay, that's pretty off-putting. So his first story is called Nipple Man. <laughs> Alright. Another time, a guy who used to be a copper and would often tell stories of his time on the force was sitting doing some hobby and just loudly telling a brutal story about saving a pregnant woman from a boyfriend who was stabbing her and he was swearing a lot. This to, and this to a bunch of teenagers. A man was shopping in the store with his son and he promptly left. The manager had a quiet word with all of them about having a bit of common sense and not swearing so much as one, as one mothers and fathers are walking in for a birthday present and you never know. And two, if that's the impression they get from hobbyists, they may just decide, well, my kid isn't doing this. This place is disgusting. Yeah, I had, I had that conversation 
once every couple of weeks. There'd be somebody coming in, like, pretty edgy, wants to tell her an edgy story, or is, you know, swearing, or, or having a go at somebody in the game. Yeah. You're going to say that every now and again. You are representatives of the hobby. I don't want to be that guy, but that's what you are. You can't behave yourselves. Don't play the game. That's it, you know? So. I had a lot of respect for him after that, because he didn't berate or get mad. Just explained what, what was and what, and what was not acceptable. A friend of mine moved to the city from my hometown and so naturally I started talking to him uh, taking him to this games workshop to play some games. It was a small store with all the tables crammed together in the middle. So you only get to play four on four by four tables. Ah, oh, that sucks. Naturally this meant, well four by four by the way is the standard. Um, if somebody from head office comes in and they say you're, they see you're not playing on a four by four table they will be generally very pissed off. Um, you're not meant to play on six by four. Uh, four by four basically keeps games very quick and small, which is what they want. Um, in the UK, they generally don't let you play in games at all. I know certain games workshops do when managers don't give a shit anymore and they just do what they do what they want. But the official line is no games in a games workshop store. Ironic, considering what the actual company is called, if you ask me. But you know, is what it is. Naturally, this meant. As the weirdos started to arrive, there was no avoiding them, because it's quite a close-knit store. One guy was super edgy. He was in his last year of high school, so he would come in after 3pm. My mate and I always had to, uh, always, always took forever to play, so he usually caught us. And would just regurgitate the dumbest, creepiest 4chan-fueled humour. He was overweight, smelly, and quite nerdy. Not a bad painter, but he seemed to cover over his awkwardness by being loud and over the top rather than being introverted like most awkward nerds. Naturally, he enjoyed a bit of a, a bit of sexual, you, you know, homoerotic humour. Oh, oh, Jesus. He enjoyed watching our games because I guess at the time about half of my army was fully painted and he really loved my hive's colour scheme. I'm a pretty cool painter. So long as it is organic stuff, I'm terrible at painting power armour or tanks or anything. We are pretty tolerant fellas, and so we just threw it right back at him half the time. One day he made a mistake. Knowing, knowing we were country boys, he used to always butt into our conversations and make fun of us being bogans. I can only assume bogan is, is like a hillbilly slang, you know. One day we were talking about some Aboriginal people in our hometown. I don't really remember what it was about. And then he made some black jokes to us, not realising my mate is Gamalasarai. Ga Gamalarai? Gamilarai? One of the Aboriginal nations. Happened to, to, happened to him a lot at university because of his pale skin. We didn't laugh, rolled our eyes, brushed it off. But he persisted. Instead of noticing our discomfort and backing off, he started prodding. When my friend explained he was Aboriginal, annoying man had enough brain cells to apologise. But now, there was a bit of tension in the air. Instead of reacting to the tension and backing off a bit, he started pacing the shop, talking to his friends and then returning to us and still trying to talk to us. It's something I've noticed in human behaviour. Some people are just like this. They can't take a hint. Or if they face a little bit of rejection, they get more, a bit more aggressive with you about wanting to be accepted. Whereas others would give you space. Best analogy I can give is my mum, who's had alcohol problems all of her life. She warps into a different person when drunk, and growing up, I always noticed that while drunk, if she picked up on the vibe that you were uncomfortable or pissed off at her drunken behaviour, she would act out more, as if she now she's now, she was now personally offended that you were offended. Yeah, I can get that. I can, I've seen that happen quite a lot. Anyway, close to closing time, my friend stretched his, tre stretched his arms, and this bloke came up behind his chest and rubbed his chest and said, Getting a bit tired there, champ? He let go and walked away. And my friend says, Why are you rubbing my nipples? <laughs> to which Nipple Man responds, Well, why were they hard? <laughs> that's a good that's a good comeback. That's, I'm going to give him that one. That's a fucking brilliant comeback. That is, a, that is brilliant. Why are you rubbing my nipples? Well, well why are they hard? <laughs> Excellent. And to be fair, High High Fleet says, "Okay, so it was genuinely quite funny." And from that point on, we called him Nipple Man. A few months later, 
and was at the store on a slow Sunday. Niffleman arrived, and for the first time, he was actually uh, talking to me like a normal human being. We were chatting while I was painting, and he became very interested when I told him I was studying a Bachelor of Fine Arts. We discussed how I'm a shit painter unless it's miniatures. A 2D space just doesn't work for me, and I explained that the art I make at uni is much more conceptual. He says, yeah, so is mine, conceptual. So he started, uh, so he started being a, a decent non-edgy, non-edgy fellow that day. I showed him some pictures on my phone. Then he started to talk about how he wanted to study graphic design, and I took an interest. He pulled out his drawing tablet and said, I could show you some stuff. You can guess what happened next. Here I am, lulled into a false sense of security. He unlocks his tablet and opens the files to show his drawings. I kid you not, wall-to-wall hentai. Hundreds of digital drawings from sketches to full-colour glossy pin-ups. Tentacles, anime characters, 40k stuff, the works. And he was a good illustrator, by the way, which made it worse. <laughs> yeah, I can definitely get that. That's, that, that. that's kind of... Yeah, yeah. Hang on, one second. There we go. Um, which made it worse. Yeah, I can definitely see that. That's amazing. Now, I'm not offended by... Not, I'm not offended by hentai. I actually think it's quite funny. I don't understand the urge to spend much, so much time on um, something so horny when a fella can just relieve himself, but each to their own. In this instance, he got me good and had such a naughty fucking grin on his face while he was doing it too. My life got a bit, a bit messy after that and I went to the Games Workshop less and less. So I don't know where Nipple Man went. Though I did hear at one point uh, from a friend who knew him that he did eventually grow up. Alright, that's cool. That's cool. And it's cool that you're quite accepting of these people as well. You know? That's pretty cool. Alright, so next. The Power Gamer. Alright, this is the second of, of, his, of his two stories. The Power Gamer. Okay, so now a story about the one time I, I became a very salty player. And I would appreciate your take on it. Was I right? All right, let's find out. Recently, before I got my dream job and moved to the countryside, I was still living in the city. This was about 2019, and I was taking a bit of a hiatus from Warhammer while I studied my master's degree. I was still painting, of course. I was using the time to just batch paint termagants and hormagants, etc. But then I ended up being roped into a D&D campaign, and it was so... Uh, and it... So it basically, my, my hiatus from hobbying ended very quickly. We were building terrain and painting fantasy models and prep for each session. And we had homebrew, homebrew rules. And I was the DM. And there was a, a pressure to finish the campaign but because everyone knew my plans to move away eventually. Anyway, friends of friends joined the game. Lots of stuff happened. After the campaign was over, one of my friends started dating this guy. He had played in the last two sessions of the campaign with a pretty non-committed character. And afterwards, the two of them went from dating to a serious relationship. He was a huge Warhammer player and introduced me to some people from his gaming group. Now, these fellas were not my cup of tea. They were massive power gamers. It was like watching jocks play footy or watching sport. They drank heavily, shit-talked each other. Uh, they had ongoing feuds with each other. They were really fucking loud, and not only were they fastidious, and uh, well, not only were they this, but they were also very fastidious with the rules. They weren't meta players; they stuck to their factions no matter what was what was on top of the meta. But they were always up to date on the rules and FAQs. Apparently, this led to a lot of arguing, read your fucking rules moments. Watching these games, I seriously thought a fight was going to break out, though I could tell it was all in good fun. Punching down and gloating over the victory just seemed to be their thing. They were all into CrossFit and sports too, and just a very different scene. My friend who was dating this guy and brought me over was also like, Jesus. They didn't, they didn't like this side of him at all. But outside of the gaming group, he was a nice bloke. But what we in Australia would call, with affection, a shit cunt. <laughs> just sarcastic all the time. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I guess um, I've known guys like this. Generally quite jockey, generally quite sporty, who will, you know, go out of their way to basically be a bit obnoxious. Um, generally, I've heard Australians, a lot of them are like this. It's always, it, it is, it's like a toxic macho culture. Nothing wrong with masculinity, by the way. I, I'm a firm believer in, in like masculinity is a really good thing. Um, especially when you're wanting to date people. 
But uh, I have heard a few times in Australia it goes a bit far, where everyone just like, you know, you know, anything that's not particularly sporty or masculine, they think is, is homosexual, essentially. Um, I've got a few Australian mates, and they, they, have, they have confirmed that quite a few times. So, to clarify things, I will call the first friend Jay. They were non-binary, so I'll be saying they, them, etc. The boyfriend is F, and a third character who is about to come up is Gay Boy. Okay, he requested to be referred this way, by the way. Alright? Alright, fair enough. So, when I first came to hang out with this power gaming group, I met Gay Boy. <laughs> Gay Boy w was F's friend, so F is the boyfriend. And he was the one member of the gaming group that was not macho, and that was not a macho idiot all night. They were his friends too, and he had one, uh, and he had no one else to play Warhammer with. So that's why he he came to the gaming nights every weekend. When we met, we were instant friends. J, being the non-binary person, F, the boyfriend, and Gay Boy and I played some Arkham Horror that night, and I did not stop laughing the whole time. I ruined the game and said, J, fuck, what have we done? Gay Boy and I were just instant friends, and we had the same sense of humour. He's one of those guys with an, with an infectious laugh, and it just makes everyone feel really good about themselves because he laughs at everything that you say. We just couldn't stop joking around. I love people like that. Uh, Rich Evans is somebody like that. If you ever watch um, Red Letter Media, Rich Evans is one of those people. Like, he just takes... Like, if people are taking the piss out of him, he just starts laughing, and it makes everybody else laugh. And every single joke where he starts laughing, everyone else just starts giggling. Um, yeah, it's just great to watch. Anyway, naturally, we decided to play some games, just me and him. He plays Orcs, I play Tyranids. So these were epic horde games. I started going to his house to play because he had so much scratch-built terrain and an epic board. And his Orc army had a Mad Max theme to it and was fully painted. Amazing, right? That was much more like it. So one day, F and J suggested that we all hang out at Gay Boy's house and have a free-for-all gaming gaming match. I thought that was going somewhere else. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Jay had started collecting Celeste demons and wanted to paint while F, Gay Boy, and I would play. Now, I had watched F only once, and he had wiped the floor with me. He played Iron Warriors, and he was uh, th this, and he had this massive exploit list that is actually amazing. But you know, Tyranids being a bit of a a, a a bit on the back shelf for a while, I stood no chance. And that's okay. But for some reason, I didn't enjoy playing against him. Uh, he came across to me as kind of the guy who uses the volume of his voice as a form of arguing. He also gives me the impression that he believes his army must always win. That the natural state of the universe is that he wins. And if he didn't win, something is off with the game. Ah, we've all been there. We've all had those moments, or we've all seen people have those moments. To put it into perspective... His modus operandi was to deep strike obliterators with a sorcerer and some combination of warlord trait, two stratagems, and an aura ability uh, that delivers so much pain. He wipes out at least a quarter of the board uh, with just the obliterators shooting. I imagine this has been FAQ'd by now. So, as we agree to the match, so we agree to the match, but Gay Boy and I tell him it's casual. Okay, F, it's casual. He agrees to not be so finicky over the rules, and we play a simple mission. Six objective markers, first blood, slay the warlord, line breaker, the works. The orcs have the most models, so we give them a larger deployment zone. Then F and I take a corner of the board each. We have a really fun match, and I'm told I'm, I'm a very aggressive Tyranid player, which might be why I lose most of the models I, I don't uh, because I don't play defensively. I just max out as much of the shooting as possible. I was doing okay this match. When he dropped the obliterators and the sorcerer, I wasn't even mad, as I had prepared for the fact that it was going to hurt. Apparently, for two years, F had been doing this. He would say, okay, here comes the pain train. In his, gr in his group, it was hilarious, not so much for me. So they deep strike, and the results are shocking. I lose, in one round of shooting, my Hive Tyrant, 25 Termagants, two Tyranifexes, one of which was on five wounds and the other was on four wounds, and my Hive Guard reduced to one model from six. When I charge the Carn Effect into the Obliterators, some very bad rolling results in all of them dying, and one and only one Obliterator dying. It was not a good feeling. Yeah, tell me about it. I had one of those fucking Games Workshop moments. 
I had always argued that tyranids don't work on the t on the table the way they are portrayed in the law. That is something that a lot of people come across, man. That is something a lot of people come across. Grey Knights players, with me being a Grey Knight player, trust me, we know your pain when it comes to, like, why are we this good in the law and then we play the game? We're just shit. It seems like you've been hoodwinked. It seems like Games Workshop have, have given you a bait and switch. Do you know what I mean? Like, look at this cool thing in the law. Yeah, in the game. Like, yeah, give, us your, give us your money. Yeah, your models are shit. Buy some more. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I do believe the latest 2022 codex has given us a lot and brought us up to speed. If you can believe it though, I actually won that game. Even though the Yorks and my Nids were down to very few models, somehow I had held on to the most points. I had first blood and line breaker, and I won exactly one and and I won by exactly one over the Iron Warriors. We ended on round four because Jay was tired and wanted to go home. So we are packing up and discussing the game. And then F says, yeah, it was interesting. If we had played properly, I definitely would have won. But it was a good game had by all. I blew up. Something about what he was saying just actually offended me. I knew what he meant by playing properly. He meant a full five battle rounds. This is because his gaming group always went to the full five battle rounds, no matter what. Unless uh, one, of the or uh, one, of the or or one of the players is annihilated, of course. In our game... If I'd continued to round 5, almost certainly Orcs would have been obliterated and he could have just scored enough points to over, over my score. That was true. But I was pissed at his suggestion because he hadn't won. Something was off with the game. I said as much. And I went on a rant. I said, even in tournaments, rules are agreed upon. And even if the tournament is using the most current meta, exactly word for word that Games Workshop has prescribed, the matches are timed. Matches don't have to go to round five when the time is up and the match is over. It doesn't matter what round it is. It it doesn't matter which army would win if they just had more time. The bell goes, tally up your points, and the winner is, is the player with the most points at that moment. Fuck your round five. <laughs> the game has been called and I had the most points and I won it fair and square. He just stood there with a shitty little grin, grin on his face the whole time. He knew what he was doing. Uh, but I felt I had to say it anyway because I hated this constant insinuation he would make that any success you had was, was an abomination. I went over the top and the night ended uncomfortably for that and, and some other reasons. I stayed behind, had some drinks with Gay Boy and calmed down. I don't know, Exile. What is your take on that? Thanks for reading through some of my o overly drawn out stories. That's no problem, man. Eh? No problem at all. Uh, I have a way of writing too much and I'm the same in conversation too. Next time I'll tell you about the RPG I made and the two year long campaign I played uh, was fraught with arguing and misery. Yeah, please send me that man, that would be pretty cool. So, um, in short, no, you're not totally in the wrong because yeah, when, when shit like this happens, it's really, really, really shitty. I mean, I hate it as well. Um, but at the same time, um, maybe saying, you know, fuck your round five and shit. I, I would say make this exact point, but make it calmer. The point you made is completely valid. Completely valid. Tournaments are called, yes. Yeah, at time. And, it, and it's just bad luck. You know, whatever time is called, it's done. And people who, who insinuate that every single success you have is down to luck, that's annoying too. Do not get me wrong. That is absolutely annoying too. Um, so yeah, make the points that you made, but just make them in a calmer way. Um, you have to forgive me. There is somebody at my door, which is just typical. So give me one second, and I'll be right back in a minute. Right back. Sorry, it's not one thing, it's your mother. So yeah, um, carrying on. Yeah, you made the right points there, man. You made exactly the right points, but um, you made them in a way that was, shall I say, overzealous. So yes, you're learning and win if you get that annoyed with it. So the best thing to do is make your point and move on. Nice and calm. So people, everyone knows what you've said and then move on, essentially. But it gets to me that uh, you were speaking about him raising his voice all the time when he's arguing, so maybe he gave him a taste of his own medicine sort of a thing. But still, but still, I, I still think you could have handled it in a much better way. So yeah, make sure that if you're making a point like that, make sure you're doing it calmly. 
You get you catch more flies with honey than bile. Put it that way. But yeah, you were right. You were in the right on that one. So our final story comes from Mike Joe Swan. And boy, are you guys gonna love this one. <laughs> so Mike says, Hi Exile. Just wanted to go over some Dungeons and Dragons uh go over sorry, a Dungeons and Dragons horror story. It's a that guy one. So, several years ago, me and my buddies got together to start a campaign with an attempt at a brand new setting made by the DM. It was, in, it was a setting inspired by Greek, ancient Greek mythology. Ooh, it's right up my alley. With, a mixed in, with mixed in fantasy, fantasy elements. It was pretty badass. Anyway, once, uh, one section of the five-man party is a couple. Happily together for a few years and married. And there is another guy, let's call him Steve. To be honest, Steve is the most neckbeardy neckbeard I have ever seen, fedora and all. But, but he gen generally was a decent guy to all of us, and he would always bring with him ba these banging cask ales for us to drink as he worked for a brewery. Oh, that's pretty cool. <clears throat> Excellent. Gotta, gotta love a guy who brings beer to a, to a role-playing game. During the campaign, things started off normally enough, Steve made a rogue and was generally causing mischief, which was pretty funny as always. His comments towards the cleric of the party, however, and only lady, in brackets the other half of the married couple, would get more and more bizarre as the weeks went on. They started off as normal odd sayings, like making jokes about bikini armour and things like that aimed at her. I could tell this didn't bother the husband, but each to, the, each to their own. It would have bothered me. As things went on, though, the Rogue Steve character would start to try and get the cleric alone with him. Ugh. He would start using his insane skills at roguery to engineer situations in which they were together, and whilst, whilst there, he would start talking to her as if it was the start of a Bioware romance. <laughs> so he's obviously trying to strike up a relationship with this woman's character. She was not interested at all. In fact, she started to roleplay her character as a lesbian just to get away from him. Fucking hell. Right, okay. Good, a good way to get away from him, though. Very good way to get away from him. Okay, then comes the tipping point. In our game, we do downtime activities between sessions where we can set things up our, that our characters want to do. Long-term project, projects, things like that. Steve, of course, wants a potion brewed that can let him alter the personalities of other people. He justifies this by saying he wants to approach the Archon of Rhodes to make him more amenable to joining the Spartans in the Peloponnesian War. Uh, we were working for them, in brackets. So the DM uh, lets him go right ahead with that. There were certainly uh, justifications from being able to get his hands on it. In brackets, at this point, I'd step down from being the DM because I wanted to play. Fair enough. Um, this this campaign sounds banging, by the way. This sounds amazing. I love this. Yeah, I, I really do like it. You know, go, going to, to in the Peloponnesian War, that's such a cool setting. One night at camp, the rogue, Steve, catches the female cleric alone on watch and talks to her quite seductively, making her skin crawl. He, he, he then, using his overpowered rogue skills, he slips the poison into her flask. Which, of course, she is drinking whilst on watch. He then proceeds to tell the group how he is engineering her to to not only be straight, but madly in love with him, and to basically want to have kids with him. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> right. I kind of had an inkling of where the story was going when I skim re read it the other day, and oh god. Um... Okay, let me just reread that. One night at camp, the rogue, Steve, catches the female cleric alone on watch and talks to her quite seductively, making her skin crawl. He then, using his OP rogue skills, manages to slip the poison that was meant to be used for the Archon into her flask, which, of course, she is drinking whilst on watch. He then proceeds to tell the group how he is engineering her to not only be straight, but madly in love with him, and to basically want to have kids with him. That's the creepiest thing I've, I've read in a long time, man. That's creepy as fuck. The husband stops the game. Yeah, no shit. No shit. The husband stops the game. He picks up his craft ale, 
walks over to Steve and says, you can have this back, you fucking creeper, and dumps it all over him. <laughs> he calmly turns to his wife and says, I want to go, let's go, before getting their belongings and heading out. After such awkwardness, we had to let the campaign go. It was just too much to come back from. We, re we did revisit the setting, minus Steve, a few years later, and we are deep into that campaign now with different characters. This is why we cannot have nice things. Love the channel, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Joe Swan. Um, that is creepy as fuck, man. And I have to say, uh, well done on that husband for reacting in the way that you did. Because he can tell he was probably holding it together for a while, and then that was the last straw. Um, what a creeper. Uh, don't do that, please. Like, do not act like that in role-playing. Gives us all a bad name. Anyway, love your long time. Uh, please make sure you go and support Composite Games. Remember, promo code down below, 5% off, all that. Love you all. Have a wonderful rest of your week, and I'll speak to you soon. Have a good one.